April 15th, 2013 is a day that will forever be ingrained in the minds of Bostonians when over 23,000 athletes gathered to take part in the Boston Marathon. They came from all 50 states and 92 countries around the world to run in America's oldest annual race. But at 2.49 in the afternoon, brothers Johar and Tamerlan Zarnaev detonated two homemade pressure cooker bombs near the finish line at Copley Square. Three spectators lost their lives that day, and over 200 participants were wounded, including children. In the days that followed, police and federal officials organized the largest city lockdown in American history. Little did the terrorists know, though, how the event would bring the city together. Just 24 hours after the blasts, the city established One Fund Boston to support the victims. The people of Boston made it a priority to show solidarity for those affected. This tragic event changed countless lives forever. That is why tonight, five years later, we will revisit the stories of survivors and reflect upon the ways this tragedy shaped the city and the nation. When the bombs went off, the elite runners had been finished for over an hour and a half. By then, it was the first time marathoners and the charity runners that were crossing the finish line, with hundreds of loved ones cheering them on. We now turn to EIV News correspondent Lauren Granada, who will walk us through the chaotic hours and days that followed. There's still living in my head, you know, there's a whole repetition of what happened in my head that goes through my mind that I have had success recently blocking it out, you know, but sometimes it's good to think about what happened um, and put it in, in relative terms about your life and, you know, when you think you're having a really bad day and you look at what happened to, to all those people. Um, I still keep all those photographs on my laptop from five years ago and every once in a while I'll look at them and um, it's just, you know, I, I can handle it a lot better than I could five years ago. I'm able to look at those photographs and feel sadness, but I still feel like the time period of five years ago is a lot different than it was back then. Green keeps, co keeps coming. 27,000 strong started out from Hopkinton this morning, and the lion's share of them are going to finish. We this year, of course, have been blessed with a better day to run. At 2.45 p.m. on April 15, 2013, the 117th Boston Marathon was nearing an end. What was about to happen next would unleash a defining moment in Boston's history. It would highlight the bravery of first responders and everyday citizens on the scene. And it would lead to a, the biggest manhunt in American history, culminating a police lockdown of an entire city. Thousands of Bostonians would become united in the face of uncertainty and terror. But for now on Boylston Street, the race clock was nearly four hours and 10 minutes. Media, early finishers and supporters surrounded the street. You know, at that point in the marathon, the runners had already finished, the elite runners had finished. So it was well past that point where, you know, an hour and a half after the elite run is finished that you had normal runners, you know, people running for charity and raising money for hospitals and picking up their children along the line and running with them to the finish line. So it was a very happy, cheering crowd. And, you know, right before the bomb went off, there was a group of soldiers who crossed the finish line with their backpacks. and. You know, things like that that you see every year, and, it, and it, nothing really stood out out of the ordinary. At 2.49 p.m., an explosion rang out near Copley Square. 14 seconds later, another explosion erupted one block to the west at 7.55 Boylston. I started walking towards what I heard, mm -hmm. thinking someone might need some help, and then um, heard the second explosion. I think at that point realized that it was probably something bad. I was literally um, standing on the finish line, um, and the first bombing was about 35 to 40 feet away from me on the sidewalk. Um, it sounded like a cannon salute. I wasn't sure what it was at first, 
either was a cannon salute or um, a sewer gas explosion, but it, it was just such a powerful blast that um, it kind of blew me back a little bit with, with my camera. Um, I could feel it through, you know, resonating through my whole body, and it was, it was, it was just a pretty incredible blast. The second bomb made me feel, oh my God, I probably jumped about two feet in the air because all I could think of then was the progression. Are there three bombs, four bombs, five bombs? Um, so that, that fear factor just did jump into my head. I ran towards the blast, um, and I think I was confused at first. I didn't realize what had happened. I thought maybe it was an accident. Um, as I got to the sidewalk and I looked over, I realized it was, it was not an accident that, um, you know, there were bodies everywhere and body parts and, and even, you know, 10 seconds after the bombing, when I got to the sidewalk, um, it was pretty apparent that it could have been a bomb and I just reacted. I turned to look at um, the sidewalk and what I saw was horrific. And uh, this photographer, as I found out the next day, took a picture of me. And the significance of the picture is not that I'm in it. The significance of the picture is, as he was snapping the photo of me staring on the sidewalk, in the distance, uh, he captured the orange glow of the second bomb going off. Boston police and firefighters rushed to figure out what was happening. The explosions were strong enough to blow out windows on nearby buildings. With my training um, as a firefighter and as a paramedic, it, you know, it's natural to want to help people. So when I heard the first explosion, again, not knowing what it was, certainly not knowing it was, you know, going to turn out to be a terrorist event, uh, my idea was, you know, if I could do some help, you know, whatever I can do. So I'm always willing to help. So I'm always willing to kind of go that way. So I went in and um, they obviously needed some help. So, you know, I was just one of so many people that went there to help. So I was not, certainly not the only one that went in. A lot of people were already there. A lot of people went in. Um, you know, I just wanted to see if I could lend a hand. Then um, police and guardsmen began to rip down the, the barriers and barricades. Um, and uh, after a short period of time, a gurney came out. Um, and there was a young woman uh, on the gurney. Uh, there were three EMTs, one of whom was frantically uh, giving CPR to this young woman. And uh, I thought to myself at the time, she's dead. And she was. You know, I didn't realize as I ran towards the bomb uh, blast that it was actually a bomb. I just reacted as I normally would as a, as a photojournalist. Um, and I guess it hit me when um, a Boston police officer looked at me and says, you shouldn't be here, another bomb could go off. And then I realized that I was probably putting myself in danger. And I made this decision in my head that um, I wasn't gonna think about it. And I guess I decided what was gonna happen was gonna happen. but. I felt my first responsibility was to keep photographing um, what was happening in front of me. The victims being helped and whatever I could because I didn't see other photographers there, um, you know, it was just what I had to do. I, I um, called, picked up my, out of my pocket my little flip phone at the time, called my wife, left a message, a bomb just went off here, I'm okay. Call my girls, tell them I'm okay. I think I stayed for about 12 minutes, and um, at one point there was an opening in the, in the fence, and I was able to walk onto the sidewalk. And um, you, I was literally walking through blood um, at that point, and I came across um, Sydney Corcoran, who was laying on the sidewalk in front of me, and she was being helped um, by, by two men who pretty much saved her life. Um, and after it was all over, I found out that she had almost died. She had a piece of shrapnel that was lodged in her thigh that severed her femoral artery, and she lost 90% of her blood. And if it wasn't for them, um, you know, holding her femoral artery shut, you know, um, one of the the men, one of the men actually reached into her thigh, into her wound, and, and stopped the bleeding. And um, 
you know, there was there was other um, victims who I saw, and you know, um, that I saw, you know, her mother, especially Celeste Corcoran, who was about 10 yards away from her, who lost both her legs. And her husband, Kevin, saved her life uh, by taking his belt off and using it as a tourniquet, and he got another belt to stop the bleeding. You know, in, in my head, I, I have this vision of all the people, and I know their names, like, um, and as I go back to that scene, to the location, I still have that image of where everybody was. So, um, you know, it's always gonna be burned in, into my head what, what happened that day. Almost 300 people were transported to local hospitals following the bombings. Buildings surrounding the finish line were evacuated and Logan Airport flights were grounded. In those first few hours of chaos, the police, the press and the public were all asking the same thing. What happened? I don't think I ever took my face off of my camera. I, I mean, my eye was constantly looking through the lens. I knew my time there was limited as to it becoming a crime scene. I was wondering when somebody's going to throw me out, but I was, you know, I worked and worked and just kept shooting as much as I could. And um, I was kind of angry. You know, my thought process at that point was I was angry, and I think that motivated me more once I saw all those people on the ground that it kind of dawned on me that maybe this was an act of terrorism. In the following three days, Boston became the scene of one of the largest criminal investigations in American history. Hundreds of hours of cable news coverage were dedicated to the event and reporters from all over the world flooded into the city. Um, but I started to do the interviews and, and of course you have a lot of um, stunned people and in a situation like that People are anxious or are eager to tell you what happened. They're really, in some sense, processing it for the first time or the second time or the third time themselves. And so they're anxious to talk about it. They very quickly tell you what was on their mind, tell you the confusion that occurred at the moment they heard the blast or the moment that they saw people running away from the site. They tell you what, what they were thinking and what their first thoughts were. So really for a journalist, it's, it's fairly e easy interviewing to do. Confusion and misinformation were a constant during these days. Users on the internet site Reddit misidentified an innocent attendee of the marathon as a possible suspect. More glaringly, the New York Post devoted an entire cover to a photo of two men that sources claimed were suspects. The day the paper came out, it became apparent that the New York Post was incorrect in their reporting. Both misidentifications based partially on racial profiling led to innocent people and their families receiving death threats. When you're in a city, particularly when it's locked down as it was, uh, there are roadblocks, there are traffic uh, stops by the police, so you're always trying to find a way toward the story and into the story even as the police are quite naturally trying to keep the area fairly clear. On April 18th, authorities released the first photos of the Tsarnaevs. Hours later, the brothers murdered MIT officer Sean Collier in a failed attempt to steal his gun. Later in the night, the brothers hijacked a car in Alston. They forced the driver to take $800 out of an ATM and escaped in the two cars. We're watching coverage of NBC News Boston affiliate WHDH on a developing news story out of that area. There are reports of explosions and gunfire in Watertown, Massachusetts. Shortly after midnight on April 19, a Watertown police officer identifies the brother in the stolen car. A massive shootout ensues between the police and the Tsarnaevs. Cumberland is tackled by an officer after running out of ammunition and Jahar attempts to escape in the stolen car and runs Tamerlan over in the process. He would later die from his injuries. From the recovered records on the first car, police finally identified their suspects. So I went to, to Cambridge where the Sarnaya uh, apartment was. Um, I had talked to a lot of people who had been uh, evacuated from their house by police. N nearby they were still searching for the folks. So I remember talking to a woman who grabbed her viola said that was the most important thing in her life and she was going to not leave without her viola. So she went with her viola, which is not a small instrument. Um, and, and people sort of recounting being woken up by, by 
heavily armed policemen in, in flak jackets and bulletproof vests saying you have to leave now. On the morning of April 19th, residents in Watertown and Somerville received reverse 911 calls advising them to remain indoors. A 20 block radius of Watertown is completely cordoned off as police in tactical gear search for Jahar. The entire public transit system is suspended for the day and schools and businesses are closed. I produced a, a story about how unusual it was that a big city, a big American city gets told to basically stay in place, don't go outside. At nightfall, a man in Watertown notices someone lying in his boat. The police surround the boat, an officer fires his gun without authorization, and fearing the suspect is armed, the other officers around him follow. Initial reports pegged the gunfire at lasting almost an hour, but later investigators say that it may have only lasted a few minutes. At 8.42 p.m., Jahar is recovered from the boat and arrested. He had been unarmed and was in critical condition from the several gunshot wounds. Things are going to happen to people in their lives, and you cannot I can't be dragged down by the fact that this is constantly on my mind. It's not constantly on my mind. Um, and, you know, when I go out on the street on April 16th of this year, um, when I get out there, I'll have on occasion a flash, something that will flash me back five years. But I got to do my job. I can't be dwelling on, oh my gosh, here comes the winter. What do I do now? I have to know exactly what to do, when to do, and how to do. And that's what my job is on that finish line. So, um, it's life. It's life and just move on when things happen. You have to. You can't, you can't dwell on, on tragic things like that. I didn't really separate my emotions. Um, you know, I think at one point I was crying behind my camera. Um, and I was angry at the same time. And I think that is kind of a good thing in a way because it made me feel um, more um, compelled to, to do my job. I, I, I wasn't afraid, at, at a certain point I wasn't afraid. I just felt I needed to be there and that, you know, I've come this far in my career I'm not going to run away. I, I need to, to show the world what, what happened that day. And um, some people questioned me and said, well, why didn't you put your cameras down and help? And I think that kind of has haunted me for the, for the longest time. But it's reassuring to hear from some of the victims themselves, especially Celeste and Sydney, to tell me that, you know, I knew when they said to me, you know, John, you know, John, you didn't, you didn't have to help us. We had plenty of help, and you helped show the world what terrorism does, and especially to them. After five days of searching, a citywide lockdown, and a shootout in Watertown, one of the Zarnayev brothers had been caught, and the other killed. But the widespread anger and confusion remained, many asking one key and unanswered question, why? That question may never be fully answered, but what we do know is that the marathon bombings illuminated the resilience of Bostonians and changed the way we think about terrorism in our communities. EIV News' Tommaso de Blasi explores the local and national reactions in the wake of the bombings. Obviously, the, the, the brothers, so I have brothers being living in Cambridge and going to the high school. There was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of um, people were very confused. And and I remember on the uh, being on the school committee where you know the press was all around the high school and um, and they were really looking for answers as to why why this happened, what was going through their mind, why did they do this? It's not about those guys are coming to get us. It's about if anything happened, whether it was a terrorist attack or a tornado, we would pull together. We know our neighbors, we care about our neighbors, we will be fine. Um, and that's the most important thing, is the recognition of the long term and that we're going to be fine. And we can take steps to be fine. 
The Boston Marathon bombing sent shockwaves throughout the entire country, and the violence that took place affected the way American communities think about terrorism, especially for the city of Cambridge. That's where the Zaniyev brothers lived and went to school. To this day, their classmates and neighbors try to make sense of that tragic moment. Looking back on it, there could be things that you could perceive as signs. There was this one time where he got physical in the hallway with someone who he didn't want near his sister. And it was something that was against his sister's wishes for him to act on. She didn't want him intruding on that and was trying to lead her own life and make her own decisions. And he felt a lot of pressure being the, the male in the household holding it down for his younger siblings and uh, his mom and his dad wasn't really in the picture in the country here with them. So he felt that, that sense of looking over the whole Sarnayev operation in the U.S., you know, and there were times when he got physical with people who got close to his sister. They, they pretty much almost grew up here like everyone else I knew, like all of my peers, just like me. They went to the high school. They were cool. He slapped hands with them. And it was a pretty shocking thing to, to cope with. And still to this day, I have to pinch myself that this person did that, or these people, these brothers. And the last time I saw Tamerlan was right outside of this building where we're talking right now. And it was maybe a year before the bombing. He was normal, just a normal guy. Slapped hands with him, smiled. It was the same old guy from high school. So when were you aware of who was behind what was happening? So I'm staying up and watching this whole thing. I turn on the television. I start to watch it on television. I'm watching. I'm like, what the hell's going on? You know, you know, it, I, it's none of this makes any sense. Um, and I'm up till two or three o'clock. Then they start showing pictures on television. That <clears throat> and, and two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. With each hour, they get more digitally enhanced. And they go like, does anybody know who this is? Right. And I look at this picture and I go like. Holy fucking shit, that looks like Jahar. It can't be Jahar. If I had his phone number, I'd call him up and say, child, turn yourself in. You, you, somebody's going to think it's you and you could get shot or beaten or whatever, right? Uh, that's how, that's how uh, clueless I was. Aronson was on the phone with the former student when he began to hear sirens coming from all sides of his street. His neighbors, two brothers he thought he knew, then became complete strangers. Doorbell, you know, the buzzer rings, right? And, you know, uh, go to the door, right? Everybody out, this is the FBI, this is the Somerville police. We're gonna do controlled ordinance explosions next door. We have to take everybody to evacuate. So I grabbed the yearbook, which I have all the pictures, of that I have of Jahar. I haven't bathed, I haven't showered, I haven't eaten, you know, I grab whatever I can to go outside, right? Thinking, what is going on? I can't make any sense of this, I can't make any sense of this. And I step outside and there are two cops who are my former students, uh, Cambridge cops, because again, I'm on the Cambridge Somerville line and the Cambridge cops, you know, they're going like, I said, Richie, Richie, I know this kid. Larry, of course you know this kid. Who, who don't you know in Cambridge? You taught everybody in Cambridge, right? So you, of course you know this kid. I said, I have photographs, Richie. And the minute I, you have photographs, right? And the minute that I said that, you know, the police come over, the FBI come over, everybody comes over to look at the photographs. And I have the yearbook right here. And I start showing them the pictures. They want to take the pictures. I go like, uh, the, the book, I said, no, you're not taking my yearbook. This is my yearbook. You're not taking the yearbook. But they took pictures of it. They said, these are the first digitally enhanced pictures we have. This is really important. Aronson was one of the many people who wanted to help his community in Cambridge, downtown in Emerson College. On the day of the bombing, Chris Dobbins was in his dorm room with the hopes of healing a city when he helped create Boston Strong. And I just remember like freaking out, trying to like, wrap my head around what was going on. Went to my RA, Nick, and was like trying to process it with him. He's trying to keep everyone safe and everyone in the building because then we went into lockdown. Um, and I just felt like, you know, we've got to do something here. Like, I can't sit here and just like let people suffer or like be in harm's way. I wanted to run down there and help, um, but we couldn't because we were obviously in lockdown. Um, and that's when I was just kind of, I don't know what really came over me. I was just kind of like, okay. Got to do something. There's got to be something we can do. Um, 
and Boston Strong kind of just came out of nowhere, uh, in, in a way. Uh, we were thinking like Live Strong, Army Strong, like there's all these communities that like help each other um, through really tough times like cancer or, you know, PTSD. Um, but, you know, we were just kind of like, okay, this is, this is going to be it, like, this works. So I talked to Nick, I was like, stay strong Boston Strong, how's that sound? He's like, how about we just shorten it to Boston Strong? Boston Strong is now one of the most defining symbols of resilience in the face of terror. Dobbins has helped raise over a million dollars to support a nonprofit called the One Fund in an effort to aid those directly affected by the bombing. We made the shirt, we put it online, and kind of just shared it with everybody in our common room. And we're like, hey, share this with your friends, let's see, uh, share this with your friends and family, let's see where this can go. And then before we knew it, it just started like skyrocketing in sales. So it was like thousands upon thousands of shirts were being sold over the next couple of days. Um, to a point where we've eventually like raised over a million dollars, um, but that day in itself was just, uh, I, it's scary and hard to think about. But I mean, five years later, it's like just kind of part of me, and I feel like part of the community too. I think it's grown over the past five years in terms of like a rally cry for Boston. I think a lot of Boston sports teams have taken on Boston Strong as a way of showing like what this city is made of. Um, I think a lot of uh, Bostonians far and wide use it too to kind of exemplify that same thing of uh, being, you know, tough. Like being tough uh, and being resilient in times of distress. We want to thank you, Mayor Menino, Governor Patrick, the whole police department for the great job that they did this past week. This is our city. And nobody gonna dictate our freedom. Stay strong. Thank you. The marathon attack forced those in Boston and in Cambridge to confront their fear of terrorism in their own backyard. Beyond that, it inspired Americans to come together, to take action, and to rise above hatred. Of course, you know, even even after 9/11 and after the bombing, you see this even in a, even in the People's Republic of Cambridge, right, in this very liberal, progressive city, you know, you start to see this backlash against um, the Muslim community, right. So we had to do a lot of work uh, around trying to heal the community, uh, making sure that we were supporting um, our Muslim population, um, that this wasn't something that became, um, you know where they were being targeted. The Boston Marathon bombing really changed how the American counterterrorism community thinks about, engages with um, strategies to combat crime, right? Or I'm sorry, to combat terrorism. Um, there is a sort of a kinetic understanding, you know, the door kicking guys going in, arresting the guy with the bombs. Um, but there's also sort of a responsive uh, understanding, right? That you have to be, you have to create resilient communities. You have to um, understand that the body count from a terrorist attack is not necessarily the point, right? It's the media attention, it's the fear. So it is how do you balance this need to keep your community safe, but also make sure that you are being respectful and supportive of the diversity that exists in our city. Right. And that's a, you know, that's, that's, that, there's no simple answer to that, and it's not something that we could just say, oh, okay, we've passed this policy, now that's the way it is. It's an ongoing conversation. Every, people have very different feelings about it, and how do you create a space where people can have those conversations uh, and, and we can, you know, sort of react accordingly? Rather than being afraid all the time, we can say, okay, this is a possibility in my life that there will be a random act of violence, okay? That um, is something that I can learn to live with. Every time you get into a car, it might crash, right? Through no fault of your own. But you still get into a car every day, you know? Um, the, I think what the Boston bombing showed us and the reaction to it was uh, the importance of being resilient, um, the importance of multiculturalism, you know, being engaged with people who are not necessarily easy to understand um, or people who are just different from your context. Um, and that that is going to prevent way more acts of terrorism than any 
NSA monitoring technology or FBI program or whatever. It's very, very simplistic. Be nice to your neighbors, you know. Um, and it sounds really silly and it sounds really low level, but it really does work, you know. And in the case that there is something that happens, um, what can you do? You know, what can you do that's active? What can you do that is positive? Um, how can you make sure that your community remains a place that you are excited and happy to be in? The marathon bombings changed people's lives forever. The scars it left were both physical and mental. Many struggled to put the event behind them and move forward, but many discovered a new sense of activism and purpose during that journey. EIV News correspondent Seamus Malek of Zali walks us through the journeys of two of those survivors and tells us about one organization that honors the memory of those whose past ended too soon. By this time, uh, within seconds after the explosion, it went up like five stories over the buildings, just from red to orange to black to gray, and, and it was just seconds. And it was like a big wave, like a big tsunami wave of smoke that just rolled over you, and people just seemed to disappear behind it, but you could still you saw too much already and you could still hear all the screaming and you're just on adrenaline. I didn't realize I was injured because your brain is just going move, move, move. But from the moment I looked down at my feet to evacuate, I never looked back across the street. My brain just somehow knew not to look. Three lives were lost in the Boston Marathon bombings. Over a dozen people lost limbs following the blast. In total, 262 people were physically injured. People left the scene suffering from leg, back, and neck injuries. Others walked away with mental scars, including panic disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. The city of Boston stood with the survivors to assist and provide as many resources as possible to help the healing process, which can take months, if not years. But some feel that this wasn't enough. In fact, many took matters into their own hands, creating new groups to support survivors. Lynn Julian found herself on the sidelines of the marathon for the first time in 2013. Usually, she stayed in her own neighborhood where neighbors threw an annual marathon party, but this time, she was on Boylston. The only place that had seats was the Charles Mark, and so I chose the table that was furthest out, uh, cl closest to the Jumbotron, so that I could see at least the Jumbotron, even though I couldn't see the scaffolding, I couldn't see the finish line in person, I could see the screen. And uh, there was a big uh, umbrella over our heads, which ended up protecting us from all the shrapnel falling down. Um, it was like any other day. The, we, I had gotten there early at like 10.30, 11 o'clock and um, sat and eaten and watched the finish, the winners come and go and it was wonderful and relaxing and uh, my little dog was with me. He just passed, um, passed a few weeks ago and uh, so that was really hard. He was the first one to jump up and, and scratch at my face to snap us out of it after the, the first the bomb went off on in between me and the jumbotron. Everybody just sort of froze. Uh, people think that everybody just runs and panics, but it's not what happens, I guess. Um, when I saw videos in uh, court from survivors in the next location, they put the second bomb, they all froze too and just stared when our, ours went off and until theirs went off. And I guess that's a natural human reaction. And my dog, not being human, <laughs> didn't know that and just jumped up off my lap and started swatting me until I snapped out of it. And I was the first one of all around us to, 
to get up and move only because he made me. That's where I was standing, just looking at the race, and a bomb goes off directly across the street from me. I didn't have to turn my head. And I knew it was a bomb. I don't know how. And my first thought, and sort of my only thought, was they just ruined the Boston Marathon. And I was watching the cloud of smoke get bigger and watching people on the other side of the street run away. And I'm frozen in place. And I just have tunnel vision. I can only see directly across the street from me. I can't hear anything. I don't see any other people. Nothing. And as I'm trying to figure out what I'm seeing, I see this one woman standing against the building. And she's standing in front of a shattered plate glass window. And the there's glass that's clinging to the edges of the window, and so it looks like white lace. So she's framed in the window, and I'm trying to think, how can she be standing there? A bomb just went off. Uh, but when I turned around, my, uh, my partner that had come with me was not behind me, and uh, there was just the worst feeling of my life, not, not knowing, you know, I thought they were right behind me and uh, we'd become separated and a lot of survivors have that aspect uh, to their story, that that's the worst feeling in the world is, is the not knowing and becoming separated and when I was able to locate him again, that was the biggest relief. Julian was left with an intense back injury following the blast, while Chalinski suffered from mental and emotional injuries. You know, like a lot of people in the immediate aftermath, of course I was sad and, and shocked and confused, and I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I was having nightmares, difficulty working, um, concentrating, and really having a hard time taking care of myself. And then I started having I guess what I call sort of more trauma-specific symptoms. So intrusive thoughts, which are essentially like nightmares, but you're awake. Support groups were established so survivors could deal with the lingering distress together. A marathon bombing support group series was erected by the Cambridge Health Alliance. Chalinski turned to the Massachusetts Office of Victim Assistance for guidance. Another important part of the recovery was that the trauma counselor created some group counseling opportunities for other survivors of the bombing. And that was the first time I started meeting a lot of other people who had very similar experiences to mine. They had been nearby, seen the bomb, heard the bomb, but were not physically injured. The city was uh, doing a lot to support the people who had had physical injuries and the families of those who were killed. and. I kept looking to the media and looking to the city to hear any mention of people like me, any mention of the psychological wounds, but I wasn't hearing them. So on top of all the feelings I was having, I also felt that I didn't have a right to feel the way that I was feeling. Because obviously I walked away, I didn't have any injuries, I didn't lose my legs, so I didn't have a right to feel bad about what was happening to me. And because I wasn't hearing the story about people like me in the news or from um, you know any of our civic leaders that kind of piled on top of what I was feeling to make me feel like I didn't have a right to feel that way so when I got to the group and started to realize hey I'm not alone there are other people out here just like me they weren't physically injured but they're having symptoms of post-traumatic stress just like I am so that was huge, getting to meet those people. In the years since the bombing, many survivors have taken up advocacy projects after enduring this act of terrorism. 
Chulinski's advocacy work focuses on informing the public about what to do on the ground when tragedy strikes. So the public speaking started about a year after the bombing when a friend of mine asked me if I would share my story at a communications conference. And I started to realize this was a, an avenue I hadn't thought about to get out my story. So then I started working to identify conferences and groups of people who would be open to my message. And I've spoken to a lot of emergency management personnel, um, dispatchers, first responder groups, to help them understand what it's like from, from being a survivor, being a witness, and not being physically injured. In the months following the bombing, dozens of organizations around the country were founded to commemorate and support the victims of the tragedy. Bridgewater State University created an institution inspired by eight-year-old Martin Richard, Martin being the youngest victim of the blast. The institute aims to give students the tools to combat injustice in the world. The institute was named for Martin um, because Bill and Denise Richard are um, class of 1993 Bridgewater alums. And the college sought to really honor what Bill and Denise Richard have done, who are Martin's parents, um, have done to preserve his legacy and also to, um, to found, um, found charitable works in, in the Boston area and beyond. And so they wanted to honor both Bill and Denise and also Martin's legacy by naming the institute after him. Executive Director Dr. Kelly Botsman was on the advisory board that oversaw the creation of this institute. Martin's parents were also on this board. When a statue dedicated to Martin was also announced, many wondered why the board decided to build a statue that directly mirrored a well-known picture of Martin that circulated after the tragedy. It's a very frequently seen image of Martin. Um, there was a photograph captured of him um, with a sign that he had made, um, no more hurting people, peace. So as the Institute, um, it, is, it is our mission to build knowledge about social justice and to develop skills for advancing social justice, um, not just among our students, but among the wider community and among Bridgewater employees, um, and to really be the catalyst for realizing Bridgewater's commitment to social justice in the community. So I think that peace and justice, as Dr. King used to say, um, are two sides of the same coin. Um, if you ever have heard demonstrators um, chanting, no justice, no peace. Um, we won't ever have um, peace in the world until we have, um, we have rectified some of the very grave injustices that um, mark not only this society, but societies uh, around the globe. Chalinski and Botsman are two of the many activists born from the bombing's aftermath. Haunted by what she saw that day, Chalinski describes herself as a survivor, although she says attention was sometimes only shown to the physically injured. With these feelings, she pushed forward to do something. So early on, I didn't actually know that what I was doing was survivor advocacy of any kind. Somebody said to me, when did you become an activist? And I said, I'm not an activist. I, but this has made me so angry. So I kind of backed into it. It just was, I got so angry that people like me weren't counted as victims. Um, and unfortunately, still today, we struggle with the city to be recognized and to be included when the city plans things for survivors. It, we're still considered extra on top of um, the folks who had the physical injuries and the families of the bereaved. So for me, advocacy just came naturally because I got so angry at the way that I was being treated. Early on, I didn't put my name to any of the writing I did or any of the um, kind of outreach that I did because I was afraid of people finding out that I had a mental health injury. But soon I realized, actually, that's part of the problem. I, if I'm going to advocate for this, I need to be honest about who I am and that I have a mental health injury. Even those who weren't present during the bombing felt empowered by survivors' efforts to make a difference. For Aaron Jean Hussey, it made running a marathon take on a whole new meaning.
something that really attracted me about going to school in Boston was the strong running culture um, and especially with the events that had happened that only became even stronger it became even bigger like I said when I run I see other people out there and we kind of just like smile at each other and we both know like why we're doing what we're doing um, even if we just pass each other as strangers. Hussey is a senior at Emerson College. She is running for her sisters in Kappa Gamma Chi that were impacted by the blasts. Hussey also aims to raise money for Casa Mirna, a nonprofit organization pushing to end domestic and dating violence in Massachusetts. I'm pledging to raise $10,000, so that keeps me up every day, um, gets me out and on the ground running. Um, we've had a pretty cold winter here in Boston, so even during the bomb cyclone that we had over winter break, um, I was running in, you know, negative 20 degrees with wind chill, and I kind of just thought about the, the resources that Casamuna provides and those who are receiving those resources, and I'm so grateful and so lucky to have the community of support that I have and Casa Mirna gives that to survivors and it gives that to the people who use their resources and that's pretty much what keeps me going every day. The Boston Marathon has taken on a whole new meaning. Many people take part not only by running but by showing support for what this event now stands for. The bombing was really impactful on my sorority. Um, the marathon has been something that's become a really important part of our history. At the time, we did have like a sister who was running in the marathon, and I did have sisters who were there at the finish line um, who are still in the sorority today. And talking with them is something that definitely keeps me going when I'm training and when it was part of an inspiration for me to run because, you know, it's something that became a tradition, especially afterwards, for sisters to run and kind of like show that we still have our strength and that Boston still has its strength, as we all know. Hussey is one of the thousands of people that will run in this year's marathon. The bravery of those affected by the bombing will never be forgotten. The strength to recognize the gaps and how we talk about it, recovery, and the selflessness to put it forward and attempt to help others. Five years later, their contributions are more important than ever. So for anybody who's interested in advocacy, especially if you're a victim, I think it's important to just follow your gut with what feels like the right thing to do to advocate for what you're wanting to advocate for, for the story that you're trying to tell, and be open to people offering you suggestions and try them. I did a lot of things early on that kind of never panned out, but it was important for me to meet with other groups to try to learn what they were doing in terms of advocacy. One of the biggest barriers to working for social justice is the feeling of disempowerment, that I as one person can't really do anything um, to change these big, faceless, nameless, impersonal social problems. Um, and I think that's false, and I think there's a kind of learned helplessness there. So I do think that um, every person can be a meaningful change agent. And I think to participate meaningfully in social change, you really do, it's a learned skill. Nobody is born being um, someone who knows how to organize for social justice or someone who knows how to develop, uh, work for community development. Um, those are things you have to learn and that's why the Institute is here, so that people can learn those skills and can really harness their power for change. In the five years since this act of destruction, survivors have used many platforms to express their empathy and strength. Fashion designer Leslie Hampton was inspired after watching a TED Talk by Adriana Hazlitt, a dancer who lost one of her legs in the blasts. After an invite from Hampton, she walked down the runway at Vancouver Fashion Week last year. Survivor Jeff Bauman published a memoir, which became the basis for the 2017 film Stronger. The first bomb went off right as his girlfriend was finishing the race. Bauman lost both of his legs, one of dozens of survivors that required amputations. Two newlywed Bostonians became the inspiration for the children's book Rescue and Jessica, a life-changing friendship. It chronicles the family's relationship with their service dog, Rescue. The husband, Patrick Downs, a Boston College alum, also helped establish the Boston College Strong Scholarship in 2017. The scholarship awards $400,000 to a student with a physical disability and financial need. Jack Manning, who lost his leg to childhood cancer, was last year's recipient. Five years ago, two men sought to instill fear in the heart of Boston. Instead, they showed the resilience of the community at the Boston Marathon today, tens of thousands of runners charged on with pride, proof that Bostonians and Americans 
cannot be silenced by terror. The Boston Marathon will forever be a testament to the power of athletics to bring people across the world together. The Boston Strong Banner still hangs throughout the city, memorializing those lost and serving as a symbol of solidarity for the future. For EIV News, I'm Jackie DeFusco. The Boston bombing is an important event. It is absolutely something that has informed terrorism research, counterterrorism tactics, um, and our understanding of what it means to be resilient as a community. Uh, and my hope is, is that's the lesson that we take away from this, not that people from Chechnya are dangerous, or not that um, Islamist ideology has, represents an existential threat. It doesn't. We will be fine. Um, but it's, it's just a matter of sort of being calm in the face of fear. And that's really hard, but really important. It's hard to explain what it was like to be there that day. And, you know, I hope the photographs show a part of what the tragedy it was, you know. And in, in, in when I look back, that probably was the start of this whole you know, terrorism thing. I don't know, I don't even know what to call it. I mean, but between the school shootings and the, the things and, you know, the shootings in Orlando and everywhere else, it just seemed like that was the start of something. And I don't, I don't, I can't pinpoint it, but um, for it to happen in Boston was so unexpected on a beautiful day. And, and I don't think people will ever forget it.